morning. So, does anyone know what an exclusive drop is? Like, besides the title of our new series, tell me what an exclusive drop is. What's that? Yes, it's something you can only buy once. Does anyone know what they normally use it for nowadays? Sneakers. So I love buying sneakers. And usually when there's a new sneaker that comes out, they make tons and tons of different versions. So think of the Jordans, right? The Jordans, they had Jordan 1, Jordan 2, blah, 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 blah. An exclusive drop is a shoe or an article of clothing or something that they only make one time. And it's supposed to be really, really unique and you'll never get them ever again. Like my shoes, these are old and I think I got them for like $20. So these are not an exclusive drop. But there are shoes out there that people will spend like $5,000 for a pair because they're so unique, they're so special that they were only made once. So in this series called Exclusive Drop, we're gonna talk about what it is about us that makes us exclusive. What it is that makes you an exclusive drop. We're gonna unpack the relationship between our identity and what we value. Because whether you're anywhere in the age of 12 to 18, my guess is at one point you've asked yourself like, okay, like who am I? Right, like what is it that makes me unique? How many of you throughout the course of middle school, high school, whatever, have tried out different things? Wow, nobody. Oh, okay, now the hands are going up. Now you feel right. Because this is the time of your life where you're trying to find out who you are. Right, for instance, uh, when I was in middle school, I would change my clothing style, my hairstyle, and the music that I listened to all the time. Like, a lot of it was because I wanted to fit in. Like, I grew up listening to Christian music because that's what my parents told me I could listen to. And then when I got to middle school, uh, I went through a phase where I listened to a lot of rap. And then I was like, oh, this just makes me angry and uncomfortable. So I stopped listening to that. And then I started listening to a lot of hard rock. Uh, and then I was just, it felt like I was constantly changing what I was listening to. My style... Uh, does anyone here know what Jinkos are? You know what Jinkos are, right? You're too young for Jinkos? Josh, help me out. <sighs> All right. Thank you. Amber, do you know what Jinkos are? Okay. So Jinkos were these pants. They were really, really popular, but they were so big and baggy, and you would walk with them, and it looked like you were wearing a cape, like you were just swimming in your pants. It was weird. And at the time, when I look back, like I see pictures of myself, and at the time, I was doing what I felt like was my identity. I was like, no, 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 this is who I am. Like, I'm going to be this kind of person. Nope, never mind. I'm going to be this kind of person. Nope, that's stupid. I'm going to be this kind of person. And I would change and change and change. And looking back, I'm like, the heck was I thinking? Like, I looked like a moron back then. But at the time, I was just trying to find out who I was. I was trying all different versions of myself because I didn't know who I was going to be. And so I kept asking myself, who am I? And if you've ever thought of that, this entire series is for you. If you've ever thought of the question like, who am I? What is it that makes me unique? I want you to pay attention these next few weeks. Because when you think about who am I, a few different words might come to mind. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hand, but think about when someone says, hey, who are you? Think about what comes to mind. Obviously, you think of your name. But what else do you tell people to define you? You might say what school you go to. You might say, if you're an athlete, like I know a lot of people like, hey, I'm so-and-so, I go to this school, and I'm quarterback for the football team. You might think of, if you've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, uh, you might think about, you know, your family. If your family has, how, how many people are going to the same school as their parents? Like, okay, there you go. If you've been in an area your entire life, chances are, if someone hears your last name, they're going to be like, oh, do you know so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so? It's like... Yeah, that person's my mom. Yeah, that person's my dad. You might feel like that's part of who you are. But sometimes answering that question, especially at your age, can be tough. Because you don't even know who you are right now. Maybe your interests are starting to change as you get older. 
Like, maybe you grew up loving sports, but now you love playing music. Maybe you grew up loving uh, being in the school play, but now it's like, ah, that's really not for me anymore. And so you might be juggling who you are. The toughest part might be, at this stage in your life, if you're one person one day and another person the next day. And the classic example of this, and I'm telling you this from experience, as someone who grew up in church, I was a very, very, very different person at church than I was outside of church. When I came to church on Sunday, man, I was a good old Christian boy. I wore the nice clothes, and I said hi, and I smiled to everybody. But then Monday through Saturday, I was a very, very different person. I knew I was a Christian. I knew I had, I had asked Jesus into my heart. I knew that I believed the Bible. But when I got to school, I talked very, very different. I acted very, very different. And I struggled with that. I struggled with kind of taking that Christian hat off and on, off and on, off and on. And as you get older, you might hear people be saying things like, hey, you can be whatever you want to be. How many of you have ever heard that statement before? You can be anything you want to be. You absolutely can. Or, or uh, if, how many people here are either a junior or a senior? All right, you're starting to think about your future, maybe college, maybe a trade school or whatever, and people are going to start saying things to you like, yeah, you got to decide what you, you want to be. And that can be overwhelming. If I can be anything, do I get a choice in this thing? Like when my parents say to me, you can go and be whatever you want to be, is it up to me to choose? Like, are you supposed to choose, okay, I'm either going to be a good person or I'm going to be a bad person? Uh, right, right? So what's the difference between the things we get to choose about ourselves and the things that are just like inherently true about us? Like how can you be unique? How can you stand out and not be just like everybody else in this world while still being true to who you are? And it leads to one really, really big question. When all those things go away, when all those things you thought about yourself, like your school or your sports or your name or, or the things that make you popular, when all of those things go away, who are you? Like really, like deep down. And you might ask yourself, how am I different than everybody else? Like, like if I'm just one person in a planet with like 8 billion people in it, Am I even valuable? If you don't know deep down in your core what makes you you, what makes you valuable, you're going to struggle. You might struggle these next few years because the things that I just mentioned, if you think about these things or if you struggle with, okay, I like this one day and this the next day or I'm into this on Monday and I'm not into this on Friday, relax. That's normal. Everybody thinks about these things. Everybody, especially when you're growing up, has those differences. But deep down, who you are does not change. And so what I want to do with the rest of our time this morning is look at a few verses from the Bible that will help us understand and, ask the, and answer the question, who am I? It'll help you understand who you are deep down at your core that's never going to change. But I hope that you leave here with a better appreciation of what it is that makes you you, but I hope you leave here with the question answered for the rest of your life, am I value and am I worth it? So we're going to look at one verse right off the bat, and it's by a guy named David. How many of you have ever heard the story of David and Goliath? Right? Little boy, there was a giant, he picked up a rock, Wee! Like that's a pastor's favorite story to tell little kids. And I love it. I've told all my kids the story of David and Goliath. But the truth is, David grew up to be like a really, really awesome king. And he was leading all the people. And this was years after David and Goliath. And David wrote this in the book of Psalms. He says, when I look at the night sky and I see the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you set in place, what are people that you should even think about them? What are human beings that you should even care about us? And yet you made us just a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave people charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. The flocks, the herds, the animals, the birds, the fish, everything that swims. Oh God, your majestic name 
fills all the earth. So David is clearly writing this as he's looking up at the sky. And I don't want to get too cheesy on you right now, but the next time you look at the sun or the moon, think about this. That is the same sun and moon that Jesus looked at. Like, I was driving one of my kids home from a basketball game the other night, and he was talking about how clearly we could see the moon in the sky. And I said, do you realize that is the same exact moon that Jesus stared at when he was walking the earth? Like, of all the things that have changed in thousands and thousands of years, a lot of things stay exactly the same. And so David's looking up at the moon and the stars, and he's saying, God, if you created that, and you created all of this, who are people that you should even care about us? And then he snaps back into it. He says, and yet, you put people in charge of taking care of all of this. So when, I, when you think about the world, and when you think about how incredible everything is, when you just stop and think about how awesome the world is that God created, the Bible says you are more valuable than any of that. So when, you, when you're wrestling with the question, like, who am I? Before you even think about your identity or your values or anything, just the fact that you are a human being makes you valuable. Just the fact that you have breath in your lungs, that you were chosen to be a child of God, means you are made, David says, humans are made with glory and honor. So if you have breath in your lungs, if you are alive today, it means that you are valuable to God. All right, so we've established that we have value, but what is it about people that makes us different? In the book of Genesis, it says, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created people, which means from the beginning of time, God created all of this, but there was one thing in the Bible that he said was made in the image of God. If there's one thing every morning when you wake up that you need to remind yourself of, it's that you are made in the image and likeness of God. When you are questioning if you're valuable, if you're popular, if all of these things matter in your life, if there's one thing that I want you to remember when you wake up in the morning, it's that you're made in the image of God. I read a sermon by a guy named John Wesley, uh, who's really, really important in the Free Methodist Church. And he wrote a, a sermon called The Image of God, and he, he coined the phrase the Imago Dei, which is Latin for the image of God. And this sermon was about image being more, because we think of an image and we think of something that we look at, but the image of God is so much more than just your, what you're seeing. It's, it's who you are. It's what's defined you. And I read this when I was becoming a pastor, and it, was so, it made such an impression on my heart, I got it tattooed on my wrist. So that when I wake up every morning, I can see that I'm made in the image and likeness of God. And if there's one thing, when you're wrestling with your identity, when you're wrestling with what makes you you, remember that you're made in the image and likeness of God. And that might make you feel good, but there's going to be times where you also might be like, uh, I'm not really sure God wants me to be his image bearer. Like, does God know all the ways that I've screwed up? Like, does God know? Are you sure God wants me to be his image bearer? How many of you have ever made a mistake? Wow, all of us. Guess what? God still made you in the image and likeness of God. And sometimes when we fall short, we feel like we're not qualified. We feel like we might not have what it takes to be an image bearer of God. But just because you're made in the image of God does not mean you'll ever be a robot. You will never be programmed to follow Jesus. So when we come to this point of, okay, God, I know that I'm made in your image, but I also know that I'm not perfect. What do we do then? What do we do when we've inevitably fallen short, when we've made a mistake, whether everybody knows about it or whether no one knows about it? We look to Jesus. And there's a few reasons we look to Jesus. Number one is because he died for us so that when we inevitably fall short, we are still right with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But number two, even more, I shouldn't say even more, but in addition to the fact that Jesus died for us and have given us a right relationship with God, Jesus is the example of how we are supposed to live. Jesus, the reason we have the Bible, Jesus was God in human form. God loved us so much, and he wanted to give us a human representation of what it looks like on the earth. So he gave us Jesus that we can follow him. 
And so Paul, the last verse I want to go over with you, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth because there were a lot of people there that loved God, they believed in Jesus, but they were not living like it. These people were like, yeah, I love God, I believe that Jesus died for us, and yeah, we're Christians, but Paul was like, yeah, but how are you living? Like, you're not really living like Christ's image bearers. And so Paul wrote to them and said, our goal, when we read the Gospels, when we read how Jesus lived, how Jesus loved, how Jesus walked, that's the example we're, the, that's the example we're supposed to follow. Paul says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and he is supreme over all creation. So when you've tried on all these different identities, maybe you switch sports because you're like, oh, I don't want to be a football player anymore. Or maybe you've tried something, you've tried an instrument or you try to play. How many of you have ever tried something and then you've decided, yeah, that's not really for me? That's okay. Oh, praise God, you've all got your hands in the air. Fantastic. Don't ever believe that if you try something, you have to do it for the rest of your life. Don't ever believe that there's something in your life that defines who you are, that if that thing goes away, then suddenly you aren't you anymore. You are all, and I know some of you better than others, but here's the one thing I know. Each and every one of you have a gift. It's different, it's unique, and it's something very, very special for you, and God made you that way. But don't think that that thing is what defines you. Don't ever think that if that thing goes away that you have to think, all right, who am I now? Like, if I'm not an athlete, then what am I? If I'm not a straight-A student, am I still valuable? If I'm not a good kid, are my parents still going to love me? The thing that gives you value is that you are made in the image and likeness of God, and that will never, ever go away. And the truth is, there's going to be things out there as you get older, there's going to be other things in this world that are going to try to tempt you to define yourself that way. Some people are going to tell you it's what you look like. You've got to look the part. You've got to wear the nicest clothes. You've got to have the nicest shoes. You've got to have the biggest muscle. You've got to be the prettiest. There's going to be no shortage of things in this world that are going to tell you this is what it looks like to be successful. This is what it looks like to be happy. And some of you are going to struggle with that. But here's the thing I want you to know. There is only one thing in this world. There is only one person that can definitively answer the question, who are you? Because what God says about you is the truest thing about you in this world. I, I heard a quote um, when I was a teenager and it really resonated with me because I had made some dumb decisions and there were a lot of people that were saying things about me. And this was before the age of social media. I thank God every single day that social media did not exist when I was a teenager. Otherwise, I'm not sure I would have made it. <laughs> um, but there were a lot of things going on ar around me. I had made some dumb choices, but I had someone at church in, my, in a group just like this who said to me, what God says about you is more important than what other people think about you. And I want you to hear that again. What God says about you is more important than what other people think about you. So when you wrestle with what is it that defines me, what is it that makes me me, answer that question with, I am made in the image and likeness of God. You can express yourself as you get older, and I would encourage you to. Try different things. Try different sports. Try different activities. Try different instruments. Work hard. Be great at the things that God's given you gifts for. But don't for a second believe that those are the things that define who you are. Because who you are is an image bearer of God. How you express yourself might change, but who you are doesn't. So we can stay new, unique and stay true to who God made us by asking ourselves these questions. I want you to think about this. Number one, what is most important to you? Ask yourself that. What is most important to you? Is it what other people think of you? Or is it what God thinks about you? Number two, what do you value most in other people? And what do you value most about yourself? When you think about the things about other people that you value, 
if the first thing that comes to your mind is what they think about you, take a step back. Take it from someone who wrestled a long time with anxiety about what other people thought of him. Let me give you permission. You will never please everyone in this world, and that's okay. God has never called you to be everyone, to please everyone. Number three, does the life you live currently reflect your values? The question number one and two, what is most important and what do you value most in other people? Is the life that you're living consistent with the answers to questions number one and two? Number four, do your values line up with what Jesus said? One of the reasons that I love doing this, one of the reasons that we actually do church is so we can open the Bible, learn it together, learn what Jesus did. We can love like Jesus loved. We can live like Jesus lived. We can follow his example. And if our lives aren't lining up with that, what changes do we need to make? And I know this can feel overwhelming, but this is literally why we do this. Because wherever you are on the range of 12 to 18, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. The Bible is not some outdated book for old people, okay? The Bible literally, if it were not for the Bible, I would be so lost in life. I wouldn't know how to be a father. I wouldn't know how to be a husband. I wouldn't know how to be a man of God. I've had so many conversations this week with people where I've just gotten to talk to them about what God has shown me through prayer and through his word. You were made in the image of God, And it's possible to live that way and still be unique. It's possible to be a Christian, to follow Jesus, and still try the things in your life that you're passionate about. And if you're wrestling with, okay, I want to be a Christian, but I also want to, like, have friends and do these things. Like, I want to follow Jesus, but I also want to, you know, be a teenager. So, Pastor John, where where is the line there? It's okay to wrestle with those things. And that's what we're going to talk about all throughout these series. But the most important thing that I want you to take away from today is the thing that defines you is not what position you play in a sport. It's not your grades. It's not what school you go to. It's not whether you have a boyfriend or girlfriend. It's not what family you're a part of. It's not what you've done in the past or what people think you're going to do in the future. The thing that defines you is that you were made in the image and likeness of God. So let's go talk about what that looks like in our small groups, all right? Before that, I want to pray for you. Dear God, I just thank you for these teens. God, being a teenager was hard when I was a teenager, and I can't imagine what it's like today. But I am so thankful for your word. I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit to lead us, and I'm thankful that we have the church that we can talk about this stuff, that we can wrestle with uh, our our passions and our values without losing sight of who we are in in the name of God. And so, Lord, I pray today for our small groups that we can go and just have some honest conversations. Father, I pray that, that the relationships that we form down here would be strengthened by our shared faith in Jesus Christ. I thank you for each and every person in this room, and I pray that you would lead us and guide us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.